Welcome, welcome everyone to this panel for Startup Starter. I'm Taj Eldridge. I am an investor, co-founder of Include Ventures, and director of climate innovations for JFF. One of the last panels of the night, so let's have some fun. All right. So I want to I want to introduce this panel that we're doing is about the future of minority investing. I want to bring out the panelists right now, Mr. Scott. Come on in, Miss Miss Edwards, Mr. Cox. You can come closer to me. And Miss King. Well, can I get one of hers? Let's make it happen. I want one of those. Uh, anyway. It's a whole lot of melanin on the stage. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. So we want to have this exciting conversation ahead of us, and I want to begin <laughs> by grounding this idea in the, in the state of diverse-owned businesses. The largest challenge that diverse-owned businesses face across the area is access to capital. For example, only 3% of venture capital goes to black founders based on also. So here's the current state of minority companies in this country. Diverse businesses were decimated during the pandemic, but bounced back in 2021. Now as we prepare for the probability of a recession and bracing for a potential downturn, we know that diverse owned businesses typically don't have a lot of cash reserves, owner wealth, or access to bank credit to rely on. So that also impacts the companies that are here. 17% of operational U.S. minority-owned SMBs on the Facebook app reported they reduced the size of their workforce in the past six months, compared to 15% of other small businesses. So all these issues come into play when we're talking about businesses and minority ownership. Equity crowdfunding, though, is a tool that's been used to reduce a lot of these issues around capital for a lot of these companies. We've seen a lot of different pr platforms that's come up. We've talked a lot about Start Engine. We've talked a lot about um, WeFunder and many others. There's others that's been popping up, such as Seed at the Table, which is one that was found by one of the greatest fraternities in the world, Kappa Alpha Psi. <laughs> and there are others. So I, I want to get to this panel, and, and I want to start with, with the brother next to me, and three questions. Please introduce yourself. Tell us where you're from. And what is, what is some of the work that you're proud of? I love that. Thank you so much for starting us off. Thank you so much for everybody attending here, everybody online. So I'm Eric Cox. I'm a member of the Net Capital team, currently the head of growth. Been here for almost a little over four years now, and I'm really proud of a ton of different things that we've been able to do. I was also born and raised here in the Southland, Los Angeles, Orange County. Um, and so I'm happy to be home in this conference. Some of the work that I've been most proud of uh, we've done some really impactful demo days. And so right around the George Floyd protest, we did a black founder demo day. Six figures raised across a handful of companies, all minority led. And it was right when they really needed the capital, right when people were saying, we want to support you, how do we do it? And we said, here's the button, push the button, right? We said, hire and wire. We're not here to really connect uh, people with employment opportunities, so we got the wire option for you already queued up. You can just push the button and invest what you could comfortably invest. And that was really impactful for me. We've also done women in AI uh, demo days, and I think a lot of folks still, for some reason, view certain categories of company as being okay for women to lead. And artificial intelligence has historically not been one of them. And we wanted to shift the focus. Women can and should and do run phenomenal high-tech companies, and that's some of the work I've been proud of doing too. Absolutely. I I'm gonna throw a curveball because I'm feeling really Bobby Brownish right now. <laughs> Favorite song? Favorite song? What genre? I can't do uh, uh, all time. I, mean, I need just time. period. Right now, right. study long, study wrong. Ooh. Spit it. Honestly, weirdly enough, I've been, I've been, uh, I've been doing. I do a lot of smooth jazz. I, I keep a lot. I keep a lot of. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. I, I listen to so many different things. I can't. That's too hard. I'm sorry. <laughs> you you got to make a decision. I, I'll Favorite? help them out. Favorite? For me, cuff it, Beyonce. Yeah. Love Let's it. do it. Love it. All right. Yeah. Next. Yeah. Ms. King, same question to you. I know you, you were earlier talking about Dudamus, but for the, those who are just now tuning in, can you give us a little bit of who you are, where you come from, and what you're most proud of the work you're doing? Sure. Uh, Natalie King, I am the founder and CEO of Dunamis Clean Energy Partners and Dunamis Charge. 
born and raised in Detroit, Michigan. The D is in the house. Um, and I am most proud of a number of things that we've been able to do in our company. First, I am proud to be the first black woman owned EV charger manufacturer in this world, based right in the city of Detroit. Uh, I'm proud to be a pioneer uh, in the EV industry. Uh, I'm proud to usher in this burgeoning industry, trillion, multi-trillion dollar industry over this next decade into black and brown communities. Uh, we are uh, very focused on making sure that community engagement, education, workforce development is an integral part of our operations. And so not only are we the first, uh, but uh, we are also hiring and training directly from our community. We're hiring and training directly from communities of color, black and brown communities, communities with low income, uh, underemployment, unemployment historically, and making, and even more importantly, communities that have been historically impacted by environmental justice issues within their communities. Yeah. So not only are we creating economic stability, green collar workforce, high paying jobs uh, within our factory, but we're also really cultivating the community engagement in this EV boom. I am committed to making sure that our communities are not left behind in this trillion dollar wealth transfer. And so our, our thought is to not only be able to provide the jobs, but create careers, create education about what this industry can bring with respect to clean energy technologies, because representation matters. And so we're very proud to be, you know, a part of that representation for our community. Absolutely. I want people to understand that what Natalie is talking about is this idea of green wealth. A hundred plus years ago, you had the transition from the horse and buggy to the gas powered vehicles and people like Rockefeller and others mm -hmm. created wealth that has lasted to this day. We're in a similar transition right now where we're making that transition from gas powered vehicles to battery and probably hydrogen. And the question is, can we make that equitable to where we would have this wealth that would last for a greater number of people. But Natalie, you're not off the hook. Favorite song? I don't have a particular favorite song, but Greg Porter right now is my absolute favorite hey, artist. I'll wear a hat for Greg. If you don't know who Greg <laughs> Porter is, check him out. He's very <laughs> nice. <laughs> Ms. Edwards, same question to you, threefold. Number one, tell us about yourself and where you're from. And number two, what you're most proud of and the, and the work that you're doing. Sure, uh, my name is Lainey Edwards. I am the co-founder and CEO of Black on the Block. Um, and Black on the Block is a monthly pop-up festival here in Los Angeles with over 150 Black-owned businesses every single month. Um, we've been doing it since Juneteenth of last year and it's just been an amazing journey. Um, our goal really is to uplift uh, the businesses that are really trying to build their own businesses and their own products from scratch. Um, and we just try to provide a marketplace and a platform for them to have access to thousands of attendees every single month, um, something that's very consistent for them, and also access to things like this, access to capital uh, to build their business since a lot of us don't have access or the financial liter literacy to do so. And I'm very proud that even some of our vendors are here today, if you go out and the food trucks, uh, buns and tails, burger guys, LA wings and steaks, all of them are amazing. Um, we've got some dessert here as well, so thank you guys for allowing some of our vendors to be here. Um, oh, and something that I'm very proud of, uh, so since we started last year, uh, we were able to go to DC, so we do it every single month here in LA, but we were able to take it to DC in July and partner with Stefan Diggs. Um, of the NFL, he plays for the Buffalo Bills, if you guys are sports fans, and it was just such an amazing thing. We had 5,000 people come out, so much support for the, for, this, for the businesses. We got support from the NFL, from Forbes. So that was something that was really uh, a milestone for us, only being a year into the business and being able to provide this amazing platform for these businesses. Absolutely, awesome. and, and the work that you do. <laughs> My team is here as well. <laughs> yeah. The work that she does is important because awareness is just as important as capital. A lot of times, founders believe that if they just had capital, the story would be ending, but that's not the case. You need to have four things, access to capital, access to connections, access to customers, and access to a culture of doing the right thing the first time. But 
You're not with the hook. Favorite song? I had time to prepare. I'm always going to go with Beyonce. Right now, it's Alien Superstar from Renaissance. Yeah. Hey. Great song. <laughs> I, I'm from Texas, so I'm very biased. So that's why I said Beyonce. Sense. Brother Scott, you're, you're bringing us home. So, I, and I must preface and say, I've been knowing Laurel since he started Startup Starter, and I'm very, very proud Thank you. of Thank this you. because I remember when it was a, just an idea of him and Jose, and now look where we are. So give it up for Jose yeah. and Laurel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, Thank you. Laurel, tell us a little bit about you that no, people don't know, nurse number one. And number two, what are you most proud of in the work that you're doing? Um, something that people don't know. Man, I feel like I'm open book. Um, I'm also an interior designer. And I'm pretty good at it, actually. So that, that's one thing you don't know about me. No, I'm, I'm, I'm very, for, for one, I would like to say that I thank, thank you for the sentiment, Taj. Uh, Taj has been a great uh, mentor and someone we can call on through this entire process from the time that, it, like you said, it was an idea. What I am really proud of is, is you guys and what you guys are doing for the community, each and every one of you. Being, being first black woman in EV, that's so powerful, right? That's so, that's so powerful. Um, Taj, you are, you are making huge strides as a black VC into minority businesses and you have a, you have a strong focus on, on what you do. Lainey, the, what you do for the community, right? You bring the community together every month. I've been to the events and you can constantly, you continue to grow that and, and, and that's one of the reasons why I reached out to you in the first place. And, and, my, and my, my black man over here, uh, Mr. Cox, and, and he's in the industry, right? He's in equity crowdfunding. He's part of helping build up um, startups and organizations. And I, I love that we have you in this industry because there's not a lot of minority and color and marginalized um, individuals in this, com in this community. And I feel like you have an opportunity to represent the underrepresented. Um, but yeah, that's what, I'm, that's what I'm proud of. My favorite song, like I, I, love, I love Beyonce, but right now I'm gonna say my favorite song is um, our song for this year, if you guys have not heard it. Um, every year we do a song for Equity Crowdfunding Week. We have a producer and an artist produce it. And this, this year it's all about getting that money and getting that bread. Um, <laughs> and, you know, you heard what I said. Um, so uh, I'm, very, I'm very pleased with, with what we're putting out and the, the brand that we're trying to create around equity crowdfunding. This is very impo a very important mission to us. Um, and I'm happy to have everyone here to be a part of it. Absolutely. Could you do me a favor? I, I, I got the, I got the uh, song question first. Can I, can I come back? <laughs> Please. I, especially since yesterday was uh, the gen was uh, midterm elections, I'm gonna say, "Ain't no stopping us now." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you, yeah. you gotta sing, sing it though, bro. I'm gonna bring it all the way okay, back. Yeah, yeah. Not, I, I can't sing. I can't sing. Don't make white me do that. Uh, white head, fair I'm, I'm lost. I'm a music guy. So I, I want to have this conversation. I think everybody's been we've been having some talking heads. You have a great group of people here, so we're gonna have a conversation about investing in people of color and crowdfunding. So one of the first questions I want to know, and anybody can take it. Um, is how might equity crowdfunding be more beneficial to founders of color than traditional investment methods? And, and, and I'm going to preface this and say, yes, I'm a VC. I'm a fund of funds. I understand that venture capital has not been our friend when it comes to minority investors. So I want to know from each of you, how does equity crowdfunding differ and, and benefit founders of color? Do, do you, <laughs> I'll let you say that. Either one of you. Yeah, you're, 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 you're a founder of color. Yeah. Well, I'm a founder, but I, I've not launched uh, a CF raise yet. But the reason why I want to launch a CF raise is because I think that it is more advantageous for me as a person, again, representation matters. So me as a black woman who is launching into an industry that is so booming right now, but being the first, you know, my community, both nuclear and expansive, want to support. They want to have the ability and the opportunity so, to support. So with the creation of the JOBS Act, it levels the playing field for us now. And so there are other factors that can be taken into account with respect to a founder when they're raising capital versus how many POs do you have? You know, uh, you know what's your EBITDA? You know, the, the main questions that an underwriter will ask. When you are able to do a CF, the story can be 
the motivating factor for many that just want to be a part, want to support, want to feel integrated in a part of a success story that they can take pride in. And so I think that as founders and as diverse founders, we can tap into our communities for su that support and, and really to become the brand ambassadors for us. And so I am hoping that this CF will not only assist us in raising the capital that's needed to be very competitive in the marketplace, but will also create those brand ambassadors that'll go out and say, okay, well, you know, I, I invested $1,000 in Natalie's company, and when I get my EV, I'm gonna have a dunamis charger in my garage, you know, so that's, um, that's the story that we want to tell, and I think that it can be uh, a real game changer for small business owners, diverse business owners that want to tell the story, want to raise the capital, but don't have, but maybe have more difficulty in relying on more traditional capital mm, financing. I, I, yeah, I, I think I think Nellie tells a really great story because you got to think about it when you talk about family, when you talk about nation building. When you talk about many things, it's all tied to stories. Mm -hmm. Stories are the things that bind us. You know, I'm, I'm an economics degree, PhD, and when I look at things, I don't look at it from a quantitative standpoint, I look at it from a story. There's a story about that drop right there, too. <laughs> but stories connect us, and I think there's an opportunity with crowdfunding to tell the story, that people get involved in it, and to really bring, bring things home. I want to switch gears really quick, and Ms. Edwards, I want to ask you a question, because I think it's related to this. Can you talk about some of the special issues and challenges founders of color face in terms of investing? Yeah, so I was going to say, I think what the amazing thing about equity crowdfunding is the accessibility part, because um, a lot of people of color face issues with being able to access capital and access even bank loans, um, getting accepted for things like that. Um, I think that that's especially as a black woman, you know, we're kind of at the bottom of the period of the pyramid in terms of getting accepted for things like that, getting taken serious even. So I think, you know, with something like equity crowdfunding, it kind of erases all of that and you can have the support of your people on both sides where they can support you, you can support them. Um, so I think that's the main thing. It's really just having access, having the financial literacy is something that we struggle and have been struggling with in the community. So to have an alternative versus the typical venture capital or you know, having to go to a bank loan, having a ton of debt uh, is the main thing for me. Thank you so much. Eric, how about you? What, what do you think are the benefits of equity crowdfunding, especially for founders of color? Woo, so spoiler alert, I drank the Kool-Aid four years ago. I've been, I, I'm, I'm all in. I'm all the way in here. And I also worked at three venture funds before joining the capital. So I've seen a little bit of, of everything. And I, and I do think we fit equity crowdfunding fits within a larger investment ecosystem and fundraising ecosystem, not mutually exclusive. Oftentimes they can run in tandem and oftentimes in you know, sequential or consequential. And we're talking, and, and if I could take one step back too, we've, we're talking about diversity and in investing and democratizing access. We talked backstage a little bit about how there's so many different pieces to the diversity element. Uh, we talked about women and, and minorities. We talked about disability groups. We talked about veterans. Uh, you know, there's so many LBGTQ plus, like there's so many different elements. I know we're largely talking about um, you know, kind of racial diversity right now, but we did, uh, you know, really want to mention the idea that there's so much more to it. Geographic diversity. We have issuers from over 25 states at this point. We want to get to all 50. Like, that's part of the diversity story. But if I could say, if I could go back to what I think is the most impactful part and what I'm most excited about here in equity crowdfunding, it has to be the fact that every fund raises a crowd fund. It just depends on how big your crowd has to be or how big your crowd is. Uh, you know, Jeff Bezos, his crowd was mom and dad. That's a, that's a great opportunity if that's your opportunity. If you want to start Amazon and mom and dad can be your crowd, that sounds like a pretty good deal. I'll tell you what, I'd probably take that deal. Uh, oftentimes, people of color, other groups, that is not the, they can't get the amount of capital they need from that small of a crowd. So opening it up just inherently makes sense for groups that haven't historically had access to capital and been able to accumulate wealth over generations. So I think that's some of the most important stuff to me. Absolutely, Make, makes perfect sense. I want to pivot to Laurel. Because as part of Startup Starter, co-founder, you've seen a number of different entrepreneurs, had a number of different opportunities to talk with them. Um, what advice would you give to entrepreneurs of color who are evaluating if equity crowdfunding makes sense for them? And also, what are some steps they can take to get started down the pathway of getting equity crowdfunding? 
So Echo Cry for, for, for me, when, it, when I look at it, when it comes to my own community and other, other communities as well, in our Latinx community, my, my, my co-founder is from Colombia. For me, I look at it, it, it's all about circulation. How do we circulate the dollar within our community further and more by leveraging our own community, right? And I think that for, for me specifically, and, and I will speak for my co-founder as well, it's, it's education-based. There is a, a lack of educational awareness around the access to capital, how to get there, what do you need, and what's available, okay? There are so many um, of our minority business owners, people that I've talked to who are part of Black on the Block, who are not aware that this even exists. And so if we are, want to become more equitable within our community, we have to give the education that we have already. How do we put that out? And for me, my own personal mission is, how, what is the impact that I'm going to leave behind? What is the impact that I'm going to give to my community so that they have access to the same rooms that I'm gaining access to and have this access to the same people that I have access to? Because even in the equity crowdfunding, there is an investment piece to it that, is, that has not completely become diverse enough. Right, and if I can do something to get that information to my own community, I'm going to go as far as I can to do so. Which is why you have this amazing type of of a platform for us to be able to speak on, and and why we continue to drive our mission the way that we do. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> sure. Thank you so much, Lorel. Let's let's open it up to the wider panel. Any of you, any advice that you would give to an entrepreneur, especially an entrepreneur of color? that's thinking about going down this pathway, or just any advice, period, that you would give to any entrepreneur that's in this space? I would say, because I'm preaching to the choir, um, don't fall into the paralysis of analysis. For me, because it was something, I mean, I'm a, I may have an A-type personality, you know, I'm grab the bulls by the horn and, 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 and go, but when it's something that I'm not familiar with, when I, when I don't have the control over every aspect of it, I may, you know, pause maybe a bit too long mm -hmm. with respect to the steps that I need to take. And so for me, I'm blessed to have a wonderful team. My husband, you know, has been in private equity for years, and so he's been able to assist me and, you know, have a phenomenal team at my company, phenomenal phenomenal capital advisors that are helping me through this process. But for others that need to raise capital, move through, even in a discomfort of not knowing and demystify the process, get people like Taj, like Laurel, that are, you know, like Eric, that are in this space to help you walk along uh, to understand what all of the aspects of, you know, raising capital through crowdfunding will be about for you and how it can be advantageous for you. I've had so many people to tell me what I should do and what I shouldn't do and why I shouldn't use crowdfunding and why I should go more traditional route. And, you know, um, and I think that for us, based upon what we've just talked about, all of the benefits that can come along with this, you know, we need to move forward. So my advice would be to any founder, you know, look into this, research it for yourself and don't stop, you know, don't allow other people's opinions of what they think that you should be doing because it's been the traditional way to do it to stop you from moving in this area. Can I respond right. to that, actually? Mm -hmm. So, so and you, what, something you said struck me. I think that it, it, what's really key here is, right, we get stuck, we, there's, a, there's a, an innate fear mm -hmm. that we have when it comes to talking about money within our community, mm -hmm. right? And I think that what we have to get more comfortable with is actually stepping out in that faith mm -hmm. of, I believe in what I'm doing, Absolutely. I believe in what I'm doing is going to impact other people and actually just just letting it all down mm -hmm. and just doing it. That's and it. I think that this gives us an opportunity, equity crowdfunding, because now it's, it's not about, oh, don't do this and don't do that. No, this is what's actually happening. Mm -hmm. Here is the proof. Here are the examples, right? So when you come to things like equity crowdfunding, you see the examples right in front of you. We can do this as well. Exactly. And I think that I think that that's the direction we really mm -hmm. need to push this forward to. Thousand percent. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, I want to I want to switch gears really quickly. Um, in the audience, has anybody ever heard of the term manos? 
know what that means? It means a panel full of men. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have that here. No. And I'm proud of it. So give it up for them. <laughs> Secondly, the, the highest number of, of people, of group, from a racial group and gender group, that are starting businesses is guess what? Black women. 17% mm -hmm. in the process of starting or running new businesses versus 10% of white women and 15% of white men, uh, according to Harvard Business Review. So what, what that says is that, you know, we're, we're seeing this, this balance and I think that equity crowdfunding has been a tool to also bring a lot of capital to it because you can have different type of investors in the space. I'm, I'm a proud investor of a number of different firms that are, that are led by black women, including all your FemTech, Charger Help, and others. Mm -hmm. So I want to I ask the, 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 the group, and I'll start here with you, Eric, and I'll ask the men first, because I want to know this question. Can you tell me about a black woman founder you know or support and how they've approached funding? Oh yeah, that's a critical that's a critical question, and I love having so many just brilliant women on the panel right next to us. And if I can add two pieces to the last part, super quickly, please. One is, it's, in certain communities, we would rather guarantee a private failure than have the potential for a public success. Mm -hmm. And I want and I want that to sink in for a second because I think Repeat you that, know that a lot of communities, and it's been ingrained in us, would rather settle for a guaranteed failure than a potential private failure, a guaranteed private failure, then have the potential for a public success. And I think we do need to, part of it is learn enough so you can get out of your own way and be confident when you actually go out there and do some things. The second piece I would say, if there's something that you want to do right now, in Silicon Valley, we used to joke around, investors want to be first to be second. Right, I mean, come on now, I mean, right? You, you want, you, I'm going to be the first check in right after someone, right after you go raise some capital. Mm -hmm. And I think what we need to start doing is start thinking about that first check. And where are you gonna start building your list right now, collecting contact info, keeping in touch with people, building your networks. That can be your first check that can set you up for a follow on check. So that's just a little tidbit I wanna make sure I got out there. Man, there are so many rock star women out there. You don't have to look very hard, very far. But one that I'm super proud of, that she's working, uh, in, and especially during the pandemic, I think that's why it was so sensitive to me. Uh, and it was basically just a really good um, kind of uh, ability to keep, make, make, protect the skin from water and using that to be able to basically track temperature uh, in school systems. And so it's really sensitive when you're talking about children. LA Unified is the second largest school system in the nation, and I think, or maybe the largest now at this point. But what they were able to do was basically track children's temperature so they could get back to school sooner than later. And I just like, from a medical standpoint, from a school, and like my, my wife is an educator from just children needing to be in the room with other children standpoint. There's so many pieces that really like warmed my heart on that being right here in LA. Um, and so I think what, 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 what they're doing over there in Ion Cell, uh, I'm really proud of, of that work. That's awesome. one of them. Awesome, awesome. thank you. Awesome. Laurel, what about you? Give um, me a, 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 a I must say, so I, I've really been following Arlen Hamilton and her story and her journey and how she gives back um, into um, Black, black and minority-led businesses, just from her journey of, be, of, of not being afraid to ask for the money, right? She came from, a, a, from, from in a place of homelessness all the way from there, all the way to, to where she is now, raising equity crowdfunding so that she can go help fund other minority businesses through equity crowdfunding, right? And so the, it's, it's legacy. Everyone wants to create legacy, but how do we create legacy within our community, right? And so those are the kind of things that I continue to think about, but she, she's really made a mark in just what she's doing constantly. Absolutely, absolutely. And so, ladies, I want to ask you, we've talked to the men and asked them about women entrepreneurs they, they've supported. What I would love to know from you is that as a, as a woman raising capital in this day and age, what are some of the difficulties that you see that, that are different and that are unique for women? Hmm. I would if, if any. I would definitely say being taken serious, especially, I, it's both my age and being a woman and being a black woman, I think it could be, you know, it's a bit daunting to go after capital. It can be um, a little intimidating and I think even just Figuring out where to start, I think, has been the hardest thing for us as a company, just because we kind of threw ourselves into this. Uh, we started this off as just like a Juneteenth celebration is what we thought it would be, and then 
it turned into this monthly event that we had no idea was going to blow up to what it was. So I think with such quick growth, it's kind of hard to know where to start, what kind of team you need, what kind of funding you need to build. And I definitely found myself, I'm a very like, I can be a very short-sighted person sometimes because I just get so excited about things and I want things to be done that day. And I remember we were planning our one year Juneteenth anniversary, which was this huge, beautiful celebration, but we were trying to figure out how to get funding for it. And we had an investor who was willing to invest in the whole company. Um, they wanted 30% of the entire company, but I was only thinking about Juneteenth. And I was like, I want Juneteenth to be like the most amazing event. And I was almost willing to give up 30% of my company just for one event. And I'm so glad <laughs> that I didn't. Um, but just stuff like that where it's just being short-sighted, not knowing kind of how to navigate that space when you're kind of thrown into it has been the toughest experience for me. And I've just learned to slow down, really look at things, really create contracts, all of that, and just, you know, go at a pace that makes sense for our business. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Absolutely. <laughs> Natalie, what about you? What, what? Um, I think that the main difference has been, and I'll echo what my sister uh, said here with respect to being taken seriously. So um, I often hear the terms, and, and maybe we all hear them, you know, particularly as people of color. You speak so well. <laughs> You're so articulate. You're so bright. And as if that would be a surprise, you know, that, well, what did you think I was going to get up here and say? Uh, but I think that it comes from an underestimation. Mm -hmm. and, and Eric and I were just talking about this. And for I, what I find uh, for women of color is the standard or the expectation when we walk into a room. Uh, maybe the expectation might be a little bit lower for, um, um, for people of color and particularly women of color with respect to their expertise, their knowledge, and their strength and their ability and capacity to deliver. And so for me, it has been the repetitive show and prove first. It's just You just stated, I'll be the first check after the other guy who <laughs> brings the first check. But for us, it really is, is more of an industry-wide you know, experience of, okay, you guys, you build this up if you say that you can do it. And then when you build it up, then we'll see if we'll come along. And so that has been our, our experience with respect to support, with respect to economic development initiatives within our own state, uh, and with respect to, you know, corporate procurement, you know, uh, pre-orders that we've been trying to get or pre-contracts. It's the show and prove first, really based upon kind of an ingrained, unspoken perception that we probably don't have the capability to deliver on what we're saying that we're going to. So we're going to need to prove that first. Yeah, absolutely. I think the thing to think about here and, and this whole week is really telling for us as entrepreneurs is because a lot of times founders think that venture capital is the only way. I'm, I'm a former banker in addition to being a venture capitalist. And one of the things I always tell founders is that venture capital is like jet fuel. But if you're building a bus, you don't need jet fuel. Mm -hmm. Further, there are all these other types of fuels to propel you to move forward. So I think crowdfunding is another tool that we're utilizing to ensure that there's diversity, not only in the type of founders as we see here we're talking about, but a diversity and an opportunity to build wealth. And when we're talking about diversity, we're not only talking about race and gender, but we're talking about geographic diversity, uh, economic diversity, and all these other things as well. So we're near the end of this conversation. We've had some really great takeaways that I've been jotting down uh, around storytelling. I love the fact that you talk about failing in private. That, that, that phrase is phenomenal. And, and I think that one of the things I want to ask each of you, and we'll go down the list, we'll start with you, Laurel, is any final words for the audience regarding equity crowdfunding and being a person of color? Um, Mine, it's not particularly for me, it's, it's not particularly around equity crowdfunding necessarily. I think for me, I think we need to not be afraid to ask, to ask the question, to ask for guidance, to ask for help, to ask for an introduction. Okay, one of my, one of my biggest, I think, achievements when it comes to where I feel like I'm going, you know, not only within this industry, but within investment and in the conversations that I'm having, is that I'm not afraid to ask anyone 
for anything because that's what I want to give back to someone else. I want to learn it to give it, to give it away, right? And if I can give it away by asking for, for someone who might have the fear of asking that person, I'm going to ask for them. Let me bring that back to you, right? Because if I'm in the room, I can bring what I, brought, what I learned in that room back to you mm-hmm. and then spread that. We have to, it's, it's not just spreading wealth, it's spreading the educational wealth as well. Absolutely. Yeah. No fear. Ms. Edwards, how about you? Going off of that, I definitely think I'm a firm believer in just being a student always, a student in life. <laughs> um, I tend to think I know everything a lot of the time, and I, there's so much that I don't know. And even just coming here, I've learned so much be, being here for two hours, um, especially when it comes to equity crowdfunding, because that's honestly not something that we have even dipped into yet. And I'm so inspired to do that now, and to it's another way to get our community involved and to also tell them about this, because we have access to hundreds and thousands of businesses mm. within LA locally, within DC, within Atlanta, so many businesses that don't know about things like this that I didn't even know about until recently. Um, so I thank you so much for having yeah. me because yeah. I'm, I'm learning so much, my team is learning so much, yeah. um, and we have the power to tell everyone about this, You know, go directly to the source um, and tell our database about this. So really just being a student, really always having an open mind and um, learning how to grow your business and really Taking in financial literacy is, is the biggest thing for me because that's something that we're not taught a lot growing up in school or from our families just because they simply don't know. So biggest takeaway for me is always just being a student. Thank we so we can do it together. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Ms. King, any, any, any final words for the audience tonight? I will piggyback off of what both of you said, and, but I will add to that, don't be afraid to pull one another up. Don't be Mm. afraid of competition. We are in making competition, we make ourselves better. And so, you know, I said on another panel or, or workshop that we were doing, I'm very proud to be the first very dedicated to making sure that I'm not the last. Mm. So as we gain this knowledge base, you know, I was as 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 we were talking, I'm like, if I could share this with these other dynamic black female founders that I know, you know, black male founders that I know, um, women that I know that are trying to, you know, really get their businesses off the ground. Once I figured this out, you know, because it took a while, my husband knows, I was like, I don't know about this. <laughs> but once I figured it out and I'm like, okay, this is gonna work, demystify it, that we, we get so afraid because we don't know it or we don't understand it. But when we get it, share it. Mm-hmm. Help someone else along the way so that they can undergird themselves and their communities. It's just gonna make us stronger. You know, the, that crab in the bucket, syndrome that we sometimes have because we think that there's that resources are so scarce and limited it blocks us from sharing and so i would say pull one another up i'm going to tell everybody about everyone that i've met here today and the resources that they can utilize to be able to tell their story and raise the capital that they need to undergird their businesses so you know it it should be a community effort for all of us absolutely thank you Absolutely. Brother Clax, bring us home. Oh, bring us home. What a special place to be. And I had time to prepare, so it'll be, less, it'll be more <laughs> articulate than my, my, my question about the song. Um, I'm going to actually switch it around a little bit because we talked a little bit about the value of equity crowdfunding for entrepreneurs, and I think that's critically important. I want to talk about the value of equity crowdfunding for the investor now. Mm-hmm. There is a potential, asterisk potential, really big part of the word there, right? No guarantees on returns on investment. Um, there is potential for extreme wealth generation through investing in early stage companies. Uh, We've seen really great leaked data from a cap table of an early investment into Uber, and uh, some sources quote $25,000 first check into Uber turned into $125 million at IPO, one of the greatest returning investments of all time if that data is correct. Now, most of us here, I'm gonna make a big assumption about the folks in here, but I could make it more broadly about America and the world. Most people were excluded from that deal. I think we need to think about our power that we have as a community and our disposable income and how we tend to put that to depreciating assets. And maybe we need to be more thoughtful about allocating a pretty significant portion of that discretionary income towards appreciating assets like ownership in private companies. So I would, on the investor side, 
you have so much power, you are a spending person. And I'd, I'd encourage people to ask, why should I buy your product if I can't buy your company? Mm. And if they're gonna keep leaving you out of the room, maybe that's all you need to know about purchasing that product. Yeah, great point. Yeah. One of the other, and it's a great tie-in that you mentioned about the idea of entrepreneurs and investors, because one of the things we've been seeing a lot of is entrepreneurs investing in other entrepreneurs. And, and that's been a whole piece of that. Um, but I want to thank the panel for this engaging discussion, uh, for really kind of giving their all, talking about their backgrounds and everything else, and giving you guys the, jewel, the jewels and the gems to take. What I would want, and, and we always talk about this, when we go to conferences, we hear things and we hear all these things, we want to leave this place tonight with action. So there's three things I want you to do from an actionable item. Number one, follow her company, Udemus. <laughs> Number two, go to one of her events, Ms. Edwards. Hey. Number three, support what Brother Cox here is doing. And number four, party like it's no tomorrow tonight with the Rev tonight, <laughs> all right? Yes, so, come back tomorrow, I come back tomorrow. I, I wanna thank everyone. Let's give a big round of applause to our panel. Thank you so much for having us. And to our host, moderator. And to our host. Hey. Thank you.